Yo, Snapchat, do you want to chase some ducks with me? Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay, let's discuss the future of food and farming, but first I gotta work out how to get across this. What is happening here? So food's an interesting one, particularly agriculture, um, because that's actually a technology in and of itself. Um, in the 1800s, more than 50% of Americans were employed in agriculture, now it's less than 2%. And so what fueled that is machinery, technology, uh, you know, tractors and all the machinery on a farm, uh, and fossil fuels and oil. So it was kind of like a technological automation of its time. It freed up people to go pursue other interests, you know, you're not going to think of creating the internet or creating computers or CPUs if you're going to spend all day on the farm. Plus it allowed us to increase our population massively. Like as much as fossil fuels and oils are bad now and we're trying to get away from that, it, it really did help us, you know, it's a cheap, uh, available, abundant energy source which allowed us to scale up to the next level. <laughs> this tree is not working, I'm going to get so drenched. Again, another historical thing has helped us uh, is, is selective breeding over thousands and thousands of years. You know, basically you've just, you pick the best crop that you want, the best plant you want, and then you take that seed and then replant. Pretty much everything in a supermarket, even like, you know, the plants and vegetables that sit there and they look natural, they look like, oh, that's, that's natural. No, they've been selectively bred. They never looked anything like that thousands of years ago. But we know we have a problem with how we create food. I think it's very similar to like the fossil fuel industry. Um, when you get in a car, it feels modern and fancy and, you know, 21st century. But behind the scenes, it's just burning oil. And when you buy it at the supermarket, it's all nice and packaged. I mean, you can buy your meat in little packaged things, and you buy your products in fancy little boxes. But you know behind the scenes, there's like animal slaughter and terrible shit happening. Yeah, I need to get out of this rain. This was a bad idea. <laughs> I guess where was I? Um, so we know that both are pretty bad. Um, you know, fossil fuels, burning fossil fuels, burning oil. It's a non-renewable resource that's going to run out at some point, and it's also leading to CO2 in the atmosphere, which causes global warming. So the fix to that one's pretty obvious. You know, renewable energy, solar, 13-year prediction. You know, 100% solar and other renewables, um, all electric transport. Yeah, easy, easy, easy. Okay, then you've got issues with food production and agriculture. Boom, 24% of greenhouse emissions are agriculture, forestry, and land use. Transport is 14%. And apparently, like, livestock is also around 14.5%. And then agriculture takes up about 40% of the land of the entire world's surface, and 30% of that is just for raising livestock. And then there's the whole humane issue of, like, obviously, you got to kill a lot of animals to make that much food. I don't know if this stat's real, but obviously it's going to be a lot. So I think any civilization anyway, like, if you just restart the entire human species, I think it would all, it'll happen all over again. We'd burn fossil fuels, we'd deforest, we'd kill animals. It just seems like a natural path towards becoming an advanced civilization. Okay, so I haven't actually got to the future of food yet, so let's discuss vertical farming, GMOs, synthetic foods, soil land, 3D printers, and replicators. Just a few random ideas I'll throw out there. Okay, vertical farming is really cool. Actually, Japan is kind of leading the way in this, and there's some Japanese tech companies, um, so like Toshiba and... Panasonic. So you can go find tons of stories like this. The indoor farm, 100 times more productive. You scroll into the stats. So it uses 40% less power, 80% less food waste, 99% less water. I actually did a story on this about five years ago, um, and this, this article is really cool. It's probably like advances here. But so five, photosynthesis of normal like outdoors plants is about 9%, and they've achieved 15 So what that means is by using red and blue LEDs, they're actually able to achieve a higher photosynthesis rate and higher output than regular sunlight, which is just so epic. They're a really cool thing too, and remember this is like five years ago, so this is probably advances then. They're actually able to monitor and control everything down to a T. So they're doing 160,000 reports per second. So what I really love about that is it's actually turning food production into an algorithm that you can play with. Because um, you can like change every little detail, like the, the amount of nutrients, the temperature, the water, everything. So imagine a future where we have thousands of these vertical farms in, in, directly in the cities, right where the food source, you know, where, right where the people are. Um, and they're all run by robots. Yeah. And if you network these farms together, they can actually start A-B testing. So they can be sharing their algorithms. They can be constantly testing the perfect condition for every single crop to get the maximum yield. It's like literally turning plants into algorithms, which is really cool. <laughs> plants become little pro computer programs that you can just like change a variable and suddenly something else, a different plant comes out the end. Okay, and then there's GMOs. <laughs> Sorry to all my organics friends, but GMO is the future of food. That is how you feed 10 billion people, 20 billion people, 50 billion people, maybe? And you understand the, the, the science of genetically modified organisms, um, it's really no different to selective breeding. That whole process we've been doing for thousands of years. It's just speeding that up. That's all it is. 
like I get why GMOs are scary to a lot of people, but I mean the the benefits. It's like any technology; it, it can have a double edged sword, but the benefits are going to clearly outweigh the risks. So, just one example: the golden rice, uh, genetically modified rice, uh, basically synthesizes vitamin A, which could save you know like six hundred seventy thousand kids under five dying each year. Okay, synthetic food. I actually think within ten years we'll look back and. Um, we'll be like, wow, why were we killing animals? Why were we getting dairy from animals? That's weird. That was really a weird time. <laughs> because meat will be grown. And we're pretty close. So this went from like $320,000 to make a, bit, a hamburger to about twelve. You know, whatever. It's, it's, they've still got a few issues to work out, but yeah. And like dairy's going to go, going to go the same way as well. I mean, it just makes more sense. <laughs> it's just, yeah. And so like regardless of the timeline, I don't think that necessarily matters. I think it's going to be sooner than you expect. But um, what will really change it is when the economics kick in. When it's cheaper to make it synthetically, if it's cheaper to produce synthetic meat and dairy, then it becomes cheaper to the end consumer. And then I think everyone will just like, well, I may as well pay for the cheaper version and get all these benefits. I think it's also fun to think about it in terms of like our, our you know, expansion to the stars and setting up a Mars colony. Because are we really going to like shove chickens and cows on spaceships and try to transport them to Mars? Mm -hmm. I guess someone's another big one that's catching as well. It's kind of like a protein shake, but the idea is that you can pretty much replace food with this and you just eat this. I would thought it'd be epic if you like sequence your genome and just uh, send that off to a company and they just deliver you the perfect food that's just synthesized exactly for you. You get 100% of the nutrients and everything you need. Like right now, the whole diet thing is like a massive kind of subjective fad thing. It's, it's no one's made something that's perfectly matched down to the chemical when most people eat, they pretty much just eat when they're hungry and they try to avoid, you know, fatty, crappy food, like fast food. That's, that's, I think that's pretty much what most people do, or they might count calories or something, that's it. Next one is 3D printing food. So people are going pretty nuts with this, you know, they're, they're printing like little sugar cubes or like chocolates and stuff like that, or pizzas. Now 3D printing your food, that is freaking future. Imagine if you just like put some goop in the top and then you just can print out anything you want. It'll start off as basic foods, but then get more advanced. And then you have replicators after that. I, I've always thought that 3D printers will end up kind of leading towards nanobot stuff. Like, they'll get smaller and smaller, more fine print, then they'll end up printing nanobots and then becoming replicators. Tomato soup. There are 14 varieties of tomato soup available from this replicator. Tea Earl Grey hot. 